Praise the Lord, everyone. Good morning to you. Welcome to Sunday School. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, um, whether biological or another way. However you find yourself being a mother, happy Mother's Day to you. Um, today is May 9th, 2021. We are on Lesson 10 of our Sunday School Manual, page 68. And I'm going to jump right into the lesson. The lesson title this morning is The Prophetic Voice. Our focus thought is that we must heed the preached word of God. Our focus verse can be found in Amos 3 and 7, which would say to us, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealed the secret unto his servants, the prophet. The lesson text would say to us, Amos, oh, sorry, the lesson text is found in Amos chapter 3, still jumping up to verse 1, coming all the way down to verse 7. And that would read to us, hear this word, that the Lord hath spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den, if he have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth, where no gin is found for him? Shall one take up a snare from earth, and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall, the, shall there be evil in the city, and the Lord hath not done it? Surely the, God will, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets, the word is already blessed. Okay, so again, praise the Lord, everybody. Good morning to you. Happy Mother's Day. The title of the lesson is The Prophetic Voice, and our thought is we must heed the preached word of God. In our culture connection, it's entitled Grandma's House. It reads, the property had not sold for three years. The home had originally been purchased by a caring individual who had wanted to bless a young couple. After having lived in the home for a time, the young couple needed to sell. However, the market was tight and it appeared it was going to be next to impossible to sell, at least not quickly. The owners had followed the advice of realtors, prayed, and had even exhausted themselves by making the one-way hour-long trip each week to make sure the property looked nice and was taken care of. Almost completely exhausted from the process, the young couple was distraught. One Sunday morning, their pastor preached a message that challenged their faith. The pastor then asked for them the, pen, yeah, the pastor then asked for those who desperately needed God to take care of something to come forward. They approached the pastor and responded in faith to his message, telling him of their immediate need for the property to sell. As they prayed, the pastor prophesied that they, wouldn't ha that they would have a buyer that week. Driving home from church, the owners received a call from a young man with whom they had never talked. This young man told them how the property they owned used to belong to his grandmother. He told them he had been driving around that morning and something spoke to him and told him, buy your grandmother's old property right now. It was an answer to this young couple's prayer. The next day he began the process to make the purchase. After three years of challenges, three years of disappointments, the owners responded to the preached word and God used the voice of a prophet to intercede on their behalf. The moral of the cultural connection this morning is when you don't know what to do, when it seems as if everything you've tried, it's, it's, it's just not working out for you, it's just not happening. Even when you think you know what to do, listen for God's voice. When you don't know what to do, listen for God's voice. When you don't know what to do, listen for God's voice. When you think that you've tried everything, listen for God's voice. When you think that there's no when there's there, there's no need to further pursue it, to further attempt it, listen for God's voice. I'm reminded of the example of Peter and the disciples. They were fishing after Jesus had been crucified. They were rolling in their nets, um, get, bringing in everything. They, they felt as though there was no need 
to, to throw their nets over, over the side anymore. There was no need to try again. Yet Jesus told them to try again, and they pulled in more fish than their net could even bear to hold. So whatever the situation is, don't look at the situation. Simply listen for God's voice. We have three parts in the lesson as... I was gonna say as always, but sometimes it's two. But we have three parts in the lesson. Um, the outline, it talks about the prophet Amos. It has subsections. We're going to talk about hearing the word of the Lord. That has subsections. And then we're finally going to talk about God revealing secrets to the prophets. And of course, that has subsections. So our contemplating the topic talks about the Civil War. At the start of the Civil War, the Confederates won most of the battles. To further their advancement, the Southern Army desired to push their advantage by attacking the northern state of Maryland. The Union Army, however, discovered General Robert E. Lee's battle plan for Antietam, also known as the Battle of Sharpsburg, on a piece of paper wrapped around three cigars. Many historians believe the messenger accidentally dropped the precious document and how many times do we do this with the word of God? How many times do we accidentally fail to say what thus saith the Lord? How many times do we accidentally fail to, to, to say what God has given us, to say what God has told us, to be obedient to the nudging and, and the voice of God? I'm not saying that to condemn anyone because I can pinpoint a number of times where I have no choice but to admit that I failed in doing something. I failed in, I failed in, um, saying what it is that God gave me to say or saying the fullness of what it is that God gave me to say and I know it is because because God dealt with me in a certain way when I know that he did it even a few Sundays ago I'm reminded of a certain, a certain person got to grab the mic and said talked about how you have to be obedient and I, they kept looking at me right and I'm like why are they looking at me um, and they were saying how it was put on their heart to go and, and to pray over someone and then Lady Shelton did it. But the thing the further along that, I watched them go to someone else where I felt like God was telling me to go. And I felt that and I saw watch that person do it. So there is so there are so many times. And it ought not be that way. We ought to be able to trust the voice of the Lord. But there are so many times where we ourselves accidentally drop a precious document. We accidentally drop a precious word that was waiting to get somewhere. And now well, who needed it and what needed it, it it's, they can't use it because we fail to do or say what it is that God has given us to say, thinking it was our voice rather than the prophetic voice or the voice of God. The contemplating the topic will continue. The Union General George B. McClellan was given the important information and used the knowledge gleaned from the plan. Well, at least a little. He used some of the knowledge, it seems. He didn't use all of it. Unfortunately, at least that's what it seems like. Unfortunately, he failed to take full advantage of the great opportunity presented to him, especially since the battle ended in a draw or perhaps a minor Union victory, depending on the interpretation. So he didn't, he had something um, that, that just happened to fall in his lap, right? This knowledge that happened to fall in his lap. And he didn't, or rather, it seems as though he didn't make the best of the knowledge. And I was going to go ahead and tie it on to how we do the same thing, but the lesson actually does that. So it says to us, many military historians have criticized McClellan's tentative approach. If he had the knowledge, then why did he not use it again? We can ask ourselves the same questions. There are certain knowledge there is certain knowledge about things that we have that we receive through the word of god that we receive in prayer yet we fail to use them it will go on christians are often guilty of the same thing we have the knowledge of the word of god given to us from anointed preachers and teachers but we often ignore it or fail to fully capitalize on it in the Civil War, the Battle of Antietam turned the tide in spite of McClellan's poor decisions. In our walk with God, we cannot afford to make the same error because eternity is at stake. So, in the case of this particular general, 
Is he a general? In the, in the case of this particular general of the Union Army, he, he made a mistake. He didn't, he didn't plan accordingly. He didn't adjust accordingly, so it seems. But in his case, there have been a lot of different things that have taken place after the Civil War um, that, that kind of, I don't want to say they fixed his mistake, but they lessened the weight and the severity of his mistake. In the case of you and I, in the case of the Christian, we cannot afford to not use the knowledge that God has given us. We cannot afford, afford excuse me, to, to not take heed to the voice of the preacher, to not take heed to the voice of the teacher, to not take heed to the voice of the true prophet because our eternity is at stake and we only get one chance. Once we die, once we close our eyes, once our heart stops beating, once our body shuts down, once we, we transition from this side to the other side, we do not get a second chance if we find ourselves not where we thought we were gonna be. If we find ourselves a little lower than expected, we don't get a second chance to do that over because God is giving us the knowledge that we need now. God is giving us the word that we need now. Not only has he given us the written word, or the, the yeah, the written word, not only do we have Bibles and Bible apps and different things like that, but he's, uh, he, he, he's waking different ones up in the middle of the night. He's assigning different ones to preach a word for his people to hear so that their word can be illuminated even that much the more to make sure that we get it. And the lesson towards the end, we're going to see where the disconnect comes from. So I'm not going to jump ahead, but we're going to see where the disconnect comes. It says, again, we cannot afford to make the same error because eternity is at stake. Like I said, we've been given the word. Yes, some things come by revelation knowledge, but there is too much that is in plain sight, in plain view, right up under our noses, right in our faces for us not to take heed to. And one specific truth that we all should understand, one specific, specific, one specific truth that we should all know is that the enemy is already defeated. In the end, we win. God has already won the battle. We have songs about it. We, 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 we've preached sermons about it. We've shouted over it. We, we, we have books and themes, conferences, conferences all over it. Yet sometimes we fail to see in our actions that we actually believe this to be the case. Sometimes we act as if the opposite is true, but we have to take heed to the word that we have. We have to, we have to take heed to the voice that is telling us the truth. Searching the scriptures first talks about the prophet Amos. As one of the 8th century prophets, Amos stands in good company alongside Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah. Amos and Hosea faced tough prophetic assignments compared to the contemporaries Isaiah and Micah. Both Isaiah and Micah ministered in the southern kingdom of Judah during the days of the divided kingdom. The people there proved more amenable, or rather they were more open to the message of the prophets even, through, even though they struggled with sin and idolatry. Isaiah served in the court of several kings. His potential familial relationship with King Ahaz may have secured his position. In contrast, Amos and Hosea ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel, an area exceedingly unfriendly to prophets. The people and their leaders had no real desire to heed the word of God and obey the Lord. Amos likely felt great trepidation, or in other words, he was, he, he had a fear or an anxiety. He was expecting something bad to happen. He had a great trepidation when the Lord called him to travel to the north and preach to the people. But he overcame his reluctance and shared his troubling prophecies with the northerners. Here we're asked our first question of the lesson. Why are we sometimes reluctant to share the word of God with others? My answer is that it's in our nature to want to be accepted. It's in our nature to, to, what's the word, what's the word, what's the word? 
It's in our nature to want to be accepted. It's in our nature to want to be comfortable. When we go and witness and we go and share God's word, sometimes people aren't going to receive us. Not because of anything that we did, not because of how we look, not because of how we sound, simply because of what it is that we're carrying. And sometimes because we when because we identify with this word that we carry and we identify with this Jesus that we talk about, um, sometimes it feels as though they're not accepting the God I'm trying to give you. Sometimes it feels as though they're not accepting you. And when you feel as though and you make the mistake, well, the, the reality of it is that Everyone isn't going to accept us because of what we carry. But when you make the mistake of thinking they're denying you because they're denying what you carry, it begins to get uncomfortable. And we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like things when they don't feel good to us. We don't like things when they don't sound good to us. So sometimes the no doesn't sound good. Sometimes the slamming of the door, it doesn't sound good. Um, and it makes it hard for some if you don't overcome that but if you don't overcome that, to continue to share God's word, but the reality remains that we have a commission to do so. We have a commission to go, and we have a commission to testify and to preach and to teach of this Jesus that has saved our soul. So we have to learn how to, even when they don't accept us, keep going. I'm reminded of First Samuel, or rather of the prophet Samuel, who, when the Israelites wanted a king, God had to tell him, and it's in 1 Samuel 8 and 7, and it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Over them. He says, They have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me. Sometimes that, we, well not sometimes, we just have to learn that that is the reality of part of this call, part of this work. The, I will, I won't say that because I'm not a um, bill collector, but I imagine a bill collector gets tired of being hung up on um, when all they're trying to do is their job. That doesn't stop them from clocking in the next day and, or even calling the next person on their list. Um, I, the people like, what is it called? The scammers, right? It seems like no matter how many times, maybe I should stop, um, but no matter how many times I hang up, realizing that a call is a scam or something that I have no interest in, I get a call stating the same thing from the thing I hung up on. Um, so in the natural, people still have that, I've been saying gung-ho a lot lately, but people still have that push in the spiritual, we ought to have that push. Yes, the reluctance is understandable, you see where it is that God is calling you to, you know the lifestyle they live, you know the environment, and you understand that you're not going to be received with open arms. You're not, you understand that you're not going to be received with the parade. Okay, yes, but it was never about that. It was about whether or not you would go. So we're reluctant because we're afraid that we're not going to be accepted, but in our fear of, not, of, our, of us not being accepted, we forfeit someone's opportunity to accept the word of God. We forfeit, we forfeit someone else's opportunity to make a decision on whether or not they are going to believe in this God that has saved you and I, so we have to get over that. And I know that answer went beyond the question, but you know how I am. So the lesson would go on and say, perhaps God chose Amos because of his bivocational pedigree. He was both a shepherd and a gatherer of sycamore figs. In spite of Amos's background, the Lord prepared him for his mission. And pause. In spite of our backgrounds, God will prepare us for our missions. For our missions, and one mission that we all share is that we're all called to be a witness. And He has given us all a testimony of his saving power. He's given us all a testimony of his delivering power. He's given us all a testimony that we ought to be willing to tell. We're okay. You did A, B, and C in your former life. I understand that. But the present fact of the matter is that 
God has saved you in order to save someone else. I get it. You don't come from a long line of preachers. Okay, I get that. But the present matter is that God is calling you to preach a word. Okay, I get it. You don't come from a, a saved household, a saved family. You're the first one in your family to ever hear about Jesus. You're the first one in your family to ever be baptized, to ever receive this gift of salvation. Okay, I get it. But the present fact of the matter is that you are saved and God is equipping you to be, a, to make an impact within the church and outside of the church. God is equipping you and, and, and preparing you to be used by him for the work of the ministry. I get that your background may say that you ought not to deserve this, but the present fact of the matter is that God has called you and God has assigned you and God has equipped you to do a work for him. The lesson will go on and say that he made sure Amos felt the full weight of the judgment he pronounced. He wasn't just, you know, coming out saying, y'all about to die and then leaving and going, and going to bed. He wasn't just coming out and saying everything about to catch on fire. Go get some. He wasn't doing that. Whatever he preached, he felt, and I'm sure that every preacher, um, that well, I won't say that. I'm sure that if you are a preacher, that you can testify to the saying that the word cut you. Someone said that was a sharp word. Okay, yes, I understand, but understand that it cut me before it cut you. So it cut me twice because it cut me in preparation, and then it cut me when I delivered it. I know that. Um, I don't know. Either way, he was prepared. The preachers, the prophets are prepared. Sometimes we look at them like, mm. They, what do they know? They, they, they're driving this and driving that, doing this and that. You have no idea what how God has prepared them, prepared them. You have no idea how God has used them. I'm reminded, I, I think it's Hosea. God had him marry. And we know how precious our marriage is to us. We know um, that we have this list for those who aren't married or what we desire in a spouse for those who are married. You know that thing that if your spouse stops doing or stops being like, you're going to look at them crazy like, you're not who I married, right? Hosea, the prophet Hosea, God had him marry a, I'm trying to think of the, you know, the polite word, but um, I can't think of it. God had him marry a woman that was known to be a harlot. There we go. God had him marry a harlot, right? For the sole purpose of showing um, the Israelites, showing his people how they had become a harlot to him. How, how they were unfaithful to him. The man of God had to have an unfaithful wife because the people of God were unfaithful to God. So when the word comes forth, and especially in the case of Amos, he felt the weight, the full weight of the judgment that he pronounced. Amos prophesied against the enemies of Israel and Judah before delivering God's judgment against them. Before Amos indicted eight heathen nations, God forced him to confront those near and dear to him in his very first prophecy. His words hit him where he lived because he prophesied against the habitations of the shepherds, and he was a shepherd. The vegetation to sustain their flocks would wither and die. As a shepherd, Amos completely understood the plight facing the shepherds. And as a result, he likely took no pleasure in uttering this first judgment on the people from the same occupation. I have the pause, the note here that the prophetic voice is not the voice that says what you want to hear, nor speaks to their own gain, nor does it only prophesy a good thing, but rather it is the voice that repeats and it echoes what God says, even if that hurts the speaker, even if that hurts the one that echoes it, even if it hurts the prophet, even if it hurts the preacher. The prophetic voice, again, is not your favorite voice. It's not the voice that you may flock to, although you ought to. It's not the voice that says what you want to hear, but it is the voice that repeats what God says. Although Amos described himself as a shepherd, 
We do not know if he worked as an ordinary shepherd or had a special position in Jerusalem. Based on the Hebrew word used to describe the prophet in Amos 1 and 1, some scholars have argued that he had charge of the flocks used for sacrifices in the temple. Whatever the, spe whatever the specifics may be, Amos understood shepherding. However, he had no formal training as a prophet. God wasn't asking him to do that which he already knew how to do. God was asking him to do something that he was unfamiliar with. He was unfamiliar with. Something that he, he, he didn't come from a line of. He had never done before. It says that Amos let the northerners know that he was not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. And perhaps he preferred not to associate himself with prophets or of the sons of the prophets because far too many false prophets chose the occupation for personal gain. Again, a real prophet is going to speak a word, and that word may not, and most times will not, bring them a personal gain. Amos may have preferred not to be, ah, Amos may have preferred not to be called a prophet or son of the prophet due to the falseness, falseness associated with the office. Or in other words, everybody seemed to be calling themselves a prophet, whether or not God had called them or he didn't as well as the fact that his experience did not arise from the prophetic guild, but from his two other vocations in God's calling. I know how to gather fruit, specifically figs, and I know how to, to, to lead a flock. That's what I know how to do. In some way, somehow, God is going to use these things to, to equip me to be a prophet is what I imagine was Amos' attitude as he pondered this. Yet we see that he fulfilled the calling. We're asked here our second question of the lesson. What are some examples of false prophets in our world today? And I'm not going to name names. I'm going to name, I'm going to call description. So those who only prophesy for you to sow. They, they preach for five minutes, but the offering was an hour. Those who only prophesy houses, cars, jobs, businesses on you. But they never tell you to come out of your sin. God is going to bless you, but they, they don't seem to discern the fact that you jumped out of someone's bed before coming to church this morning. But they're telling you that God is going to bless you and God is going to do this, that, and the third. But they're not telling you to get yourselves together. They're not telling you to come out of your sin. Those who prophecies are shouted over and danced over. And we, we, we made Facebook statuses about them. We posted on our Instagram story. We went live on social media as the prophet, prophet was saying what it is they had to say. We did all of this. Yet so many years later, the prophecy has still not come to pass. Not because there isn't, it, not because they ran out of time to come to pass, but rather the fact that God never said it. And then finally those, well not really finally, I can go on, but I'm gonna stop here. Those who God looks at, and he not only looks at them and says that I never knew you, but he says that I surely never said that. The prophets that don't align up with that don't line up with God's word. The prophets that God didn't call. The prophets that God doesn't speak to you. How can you call yourself a prophet? And I know I'm getting hyped. This is not um. This this ain't this ain't pointed at nobody that's watching this, right? But how can someone call themselves a prophet and they have never heard God's voice? These are the false prophets in our world today. They have a social media following. They have a show on TBN. They, they're, they're popular, but yet they're not called. They, they can't hear God. They, they can't, and if they can't hear God, they certainly can't echo God. They certainly can't say what it is that God said. Then moving on in the lesson, though, it talks about how Amos was called to prophesy. Despite the gaping holes in his prophetic resume, Amos accepted the call. Like many other prophets, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, he may have felt reluctant to speak for the Lord. Perhaps Amos felt he had the worst background when compared to the others. After all, Moses grew up in Pharaoh's court and Isaiah had connections to the royal family. Although Jeremiah came from a family of disavowed priests and Anathoth, at least he had a link to the ministry. When Amos stated he was not a son of the prophet, he revealed that no prophet had chosen to engage his services as an apprentice. 
And yet, and despite, and in spite of all of that, God chose Amos for a very special mission. I personally imagine Amos, you know, had the attitude that, God, I know that you're telling me that I, you want me to go and say thus, and I know that you're um, calling me to be a prophet, but the folks that are a prophet, God, um, they're not even calling me to teach me. They're not even showing me the ropes. And now you want me to walk alongside them. I imagine that in his reluctancy, um, maybe this may have come across his mind. And I know that in certain reluctancy of fulfilling ministry of my own and fulfilling ministry that God has called you to do, that we can testify to the same that God, I hear you, but I see them. God, I hear you, but I hear them telling me what I'm not. I hear what you're calling me to do and what you're calling me to be and what you're asking me to say, but they seem to be doing it better and they, they seem to think that um I need to stay in my lane. So sometimes we have this attitude, but again, like Amos, we have to accept the call. If you have been chosen as a prophetic voice, if you have your ear to the mouth of God, if God has chosen you to say what thus saith the Lord, you have to be mindful. We have to be mindful to actually accept the call. Like many other prophets, I'm sorry, Amos boldly declared, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophet. And this is King James Version. I'm not going to lie. It tripped me up a little bit earlier. But this is the, to make it plain, to give my version of the Amplified Version. Um, and pretty much saying this, God isn't, it's not the saying that God isn't going to do anything at all. It's saying that before God does something, he's going to let it be known to those who are listening, that he's going to do what it is that he's, he's not going to do, and it's not that he can't, you know, he's God, he, he's sovereign, he can do what he wants, but despite all of that, he lets, he lets his people know, he lets his prophets know that he's going to do A, B, and C before he does it. It says, basically, as a prophet, Amos had special knowledge, but he chose to share with others. Though they may not have expected such horrific judgment from the Lord, the, the, the case of the matter sometimes is not that God didn't say it. It's not that God didn't send a word. It's not that God didn't send judgment. And I know that we talk about, and I'm, I'm well, this is a group, so I'm probably not. And I, I know I'm going to catch, if I was the post, I would catch some flat. Many people preach, God, we, nobody knew the world was going to shut down. Nobody knew a pandemic was coming. I would argue that. Some people were aware that something bad was about to happen. We may not have known the, the, the details. We may not have known that it was spread this long, that it would be coming this form. We may not have known the details of it, but some knew that judgment was coming. It's just that with the knowledge that judgment was coming, some didn't open their mouths to say it. Some did open their mouths to say it, and we the people didn't take heed to the word that was being given. We looked at the people on YouTube crying and, and talking that A, B, and C is going to happen and saying there's something wrong with them. They need to turn that camera off and get off of here. We have that attitude, but the fact remains. The word will let us know that God will do nothing. I'm trying to quote the scripture verbatim. Um, I'm all, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Again, God does not leave himself without a witness. We just have to be mindful to take heed. In today's world, many people often view prophets, preachers, and evangelists as bringers of hope. In the ancient world, more often than not, they were harbinger, harbingers of doom. Because God gave them clear visions of the destruction to come, many of them felt an incredible weight of sadness and responsibility when they shared the fierce and fiery words of the Lord. No wonder they expressed so much reluctance at the call. They did not want to speak horrors into people's lives, but as obedient servants, they put aside their personal feelings and heeded the call. So again, don't get me wrong. Like I understand when someone is reluctant, but I also understand that 
there's a call that has been made. It's not about how we feel about it. It's about what God has said. It's not about whether or not we agree with the word. It's about what God has said. It's not about whether or not we like the word. It's about what God has said. It's, never, it's not about whether or not it causes us to shout, whether or not it causes us to dance, whether or not it causes us to get up out our seat and walk a little bit closer to the pulpit. It's not about those things. It's about what God has has said the second part of the lesson let's say hear the word of the lord amos declared the word of the lord by comparing the voice of god to a roaring lion the lord roared from zion causing the land and the sky to tremble oftentimes the word roar appears in verses that describe thunder the roar can also be used to describe an earthquake Amos became famous for correctly predicting an earthquake. The Lord roared with the sound of thunder and the rumbling of an earthquake. The people could not escape the roar of the Lord, and yet they had become deaf to the voice of the Lord. The situation is akin to modern day people walking down the street with earbuds of me, with earbuds and listening to their favorite music, oblivious to the fires, the car wrecks, the sirens of police cars and ambulances, the blowing of the horns because something is about to happen. Um, surrounding them, Israel had not attuned itself to hear the word of the Lord. It's not that they didn't have the ability, they didn't have they didn't position themselves, so to speak. They didn't position their hearing, so to speak. They they heard what they wanted to, but they didn't hear the voice of the So they, didn't, they had the ability to hear. They just heard what they wanted to hear. It says in Amos 3 and 8, the prophet asked the question, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? The people do not fear because they cannot hear, Nevertheless, the roar of the Lord had special meaning. A lion's roar signifies catching prey. The Lord had captured Israel and the surrounding nation. If we can pause again, some might argue, how can God hold them accountable if they couldn't hear? But again, as I said, the problem with this is the fact that they couldn't hear because they could hear they had the ability to hear but the problem here is the fact that they did not attune their ears to hear the voice of god and all their and as they whatever they did and all their doings as they decided what and what what they would hear and what they drowned out somewhere along some way somehow god's voice found itself on the side of the things that they were going to drown out the things that they were going to ignore the things that they were going to choose not to listen to. And because they made the decision to choose not to hear God's voice, to, to listen to God's voice, to be in a position to listen to God's voice, then they missed the word and then they missed the judgment before this particular word of judgment came. And it's not that this was the first word, the, the word that they received. This is not that this is the first prophet that came to them. Rather, this is the prophet that God sent to let you know, well, I tried. You didn't listen. You had a space to repent. You didn't do so. You're, you're called to do this and you're set aside for me, yet you're out living like a harlot for all these other nations. So since you don't want to take heed to my warning, since you don't want to hear my voice, I'm going to go ahead and send the fire. I'm going to go ahead and send the judgment and I'm going to go ahead and punish the sin that I said I would punish like I said I would do from the beginning and to connect that with us sometimes so yeah sometimes we do the same thing we tune out the voice of God we listen to everything else we listen to everybody else but when God is speaking to us with the still small voice we don't seem to hear it we don't seem to we don't seem to be able to discern God talking to us. We, we brush it off. We shun it away. It's like in the cartoons when you see the little the, the, the red guy or the white guy, the angel or the devil. In some way, somehow, we flick God off of our shoulder. We, we've removed his presence from our voice. And now we're wondering, well, or rather we've removed his voice 
from and we've removed ourselves from his presence, making it hard to hear his voice, and we're we're trying to figure out why we can't hear God way over yonder. If the word of God is coming forth and there's a preacher in the pulpit here in this sanctuary, right? Um, and someone is down the street at Thirsty's, not the whatever it's called, Goose Creek. And they're complaining about not being able to hear the preacher in here. The issue isn't the fact that they don't have the ability to hear. Rather, the issue is the fact that they aren't found in the place, in the sanctuary, where they can hear the word of God. And I said on that to tie this into, the, tie this into us. If a word comes forth at a particular body, specifically I keep forgetting where the room. When the word comes forth in this body, in this thing, at this at Calvary, it comes forth for the body as whole, as a whole. The whole body is to take heed to it. Maybe it doesn't apply to you in that moment. Keep it for when it applies, because sooner or later it's going to be. It's going to apply. If you decide that you're not going to come to church that Sunday, if you decide, oh, I can watch a live, but you fall asleep during the live and you didn't hear anything. Or you decide that you're going to go and hang with friends or go and do A, B, and whatever um, outside of things that you can't do, outside of things outside of your control, something that you could have made a decision to be in the presence of God, to be in the house, and you're not present. You're not present for Sunday morning worship. You're not present for Bible study. You're not present for whatever it is that you should be there for. If you're in the discipleship class, you're not present for the discipleship class when it's had. You can't charge God for you not knowing because he made the way for you to know. He gave you the opportunity for you to hear it and you're still held accountable to that word. You're still held accountable to whatever word came over the pulpit. You're still held accountable to whatever was taught in the Bible study lesson, in the Sunday school lesson. You're still held accountable for that. It's just that you didn't show up. It's not God, it's not on God, it's not God's fault. Rather, you didn't show up. You weren't found where it is that you needed to be. It says that God pronounced judgment by fire on heathen nations. I'm sorry, it's asking us the question, what are some distractions that prevent us from truly listening to the Lord? Misplaced priorities, jobs, schools, schooling, career, chores, relationships, pursuing everything but God, not letting God be prioritizing our lives. All of these are just some contributions that that, that, that it, it factors in to us becoming deaf to the voice of God. It factors in to us not being able to hear God. It's not that God isn't speaking. It's not that God isn't sending his word. It's just that we aren't doing what we need to do to be able to hear so it says, God pronounced judgment by fire on heathen nations. God called on Amos to judge six heathen nations. Damascus, which I believe is in parentheses because that's modern day Syria. Gaza or Philistia. Ty, Phoenicia, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. Amos indicated the nations for their sins by declaring they would be punished for three transgressions and for four. The phrase reveals the egregiousness, or in other words, the shock or the very bad, badness isn't a word, is it? The, the, the bad shock of the last item listed in each judgment. And it's similar to the declaration in Proverbs 6 and 16 that says, these six things doth the Lord hate, yet seven are an abomination unto him. The Lord punished each nation for their heinous acts, and no doubt the Israelites rejoiced at, or no doubt the Israelites rejoiced to hear that Amos denounced their hated enemies. While they should have felt appalled at the atrocious acts of these nations, they were more concerned with seeing them judge. And with that, right, you're concerned with being them judge. You're saying that, oh, they deserve this. Even in, um, I, I know this is going to be a touchy subject, even for myself. But even in the case of different um, cop-related shootings, right, where we know racism is a, a factor, different things like that, and we're saying, 
they need to, we feel as though a life has been taken, sometimes different saints um, feel as though that their life needs to be taken, different things like that, right? We seem to have forgotten that souls still need to be saved. We seem to have forgotten that um, repentance still is a thing. We seem to have forgotten that, you know, God's blood covers all things, that love covers a multitude of sins. We seem to have forgotten all of that. And we're focused, too many, I should say, I won't say we as a whole, but too many are focused on solely judgment. Too many are focused on solely, um, and, and I know I get it. You want to see justice do, I, as myself, I get it. But in all this judging that we do, whatever, whatever confines that we speak on someone else, we have to, we have to be willing to take heed to those same ones, right? So it says in Matthew 7 and 2, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. What you expect, I expect of you. What you expect of them, you better be able to measure up to. And we see here that while um, the Israelites rejoiced to hear Amos denounce their hated enemies, they're, they, they're happy about it. They, they got the just due. They must have forgotten about their sins. They must have forgotten about what it is they have done. Because we see the lesson go on and tell us that God pronounced judgment by fire on Judah. The Lord did not end his pronouncement of judgment with the six nations. He didn't end his judgment with the nations um, that were against his chosen people, his nation. Instead, he turned to Judah, his chosen people. God indicted them for not following his commandments. Judah was not merely subject to a universal law the Lord had ordained for all people, but the southern kingdom specifically had a very special covenant relationship with God that required complete obedience to his word. Unfortunately, Judah chose to ignore the law of the Lord, and as a result, the kingdom faced the same punishment as other nations. Lord, they did A, B, and C. Get them. Forgetting that you've done the same A, B, and C. I don't know if you're looking at their A as a capital and your A as a lowercase, but the letter still remains the same. If they deserve that judgment, you too deserve that judgment. And that is how, that, that is the sad, um, or rather the rude awakening that Judah found out. And then it goes on that Israel had the same rude awakening, because of course this is the time where they're split, but upon hearing judgment pronounced on the southern kingdom of Judah, the people of Israel may have also rejoiced. At this point, Amos could have stopped prophesying. The elite, the, the elite northerners would have likely celebrated his prophecies against their hated enemies and their despised kin in Judah. Now, the, the special thing about this, or the thing worthy to be pointed out about this is Amos was afraid or reluctant to prophesy to the northerners, right? They were rejoicing at what he had prophesied thus far. Now, he had to prophesy some more. So they already know right, but now the people that he's expecting to like him, the people that he feels go would be easier to prophesy to, now he has to go and tell them the same thing. Y'all about to get judged by fire. And specifically, the lesson will tell us that Amos had one last and most important prophecy to give. While Amos mentioned a few sins of the other nations, he described seven sins of Israel, showing the importance of his for three transgressions and for four. Amos charged Israel with the following sins, selling the righteous for silver, selling the needy for a pair of sandals, trampling the poor, turning away the meek and afflicted, sexual exploitation, keeping garments taken in pledge, and drinking wine bought with fines. These seven sins proved especially egregious because the elite northerners committed them against their own people. We talk about black on black crime. This was the Israelites against the Israelites or Israelites on Israelites type of thing, type of situation. For their seven sins, God provided seven punishments that came to fruition in the in the in either, excuse me, the earthquake, a war, or perhaps both. The swift will not escape, the strong will not find strength. The warrior will not be able to save his own life. The archer will not stand. The swift will not save himself. The horseman will not deliver himself. And the courageous will flee naked. 
It says that God judges sin but desires to save. Because God is a just God, then he must punish unrighteousness. It says for the wages of sin is death. It, the word tells us different things about sin. Even in the New Testament, even today, sin is still judged. It may not be judged as immediately as the ground opening up to swallow Korah and those that followed him and when they rose up against Moses. But the case still remains, the fact still remains that God is going to punish unrighteousness. However, there is hope. Even though the Lord judges people for their sins, he truly desires to save them. God gave us the plan of salvation so we might find an escape from judgment by repenting of our sins, being baptized in the name of Jesus, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. With the sign of speaking in tongues, many times people sin and fall into judgment because they do not feel loved. Those who feel unloved and, des and despise act out. They sin. They make mistakes. However, God does not merely see all of these actions as pure wickedness because he recognizes these are often a cry for help. And sometimes God allows a measure of judgment to come into people's lives to help them find their way back to the Lord. I'm sure we've all heard the testimony that it would begin with um, when I had no choice but to depend on God. When I found myself, my back against the wall, I found out that the wall that my back against, my, the wall that my back was against was God. When I hit rock bottom, I found out that God was the rock at the bottom. We've heard these testimonies and many people have testified that God had to get their attention because they weren't, they were bent on self-destruction. They viewed, however, God's judgment as their saving grace. If God did not judge them, they would have continued on. They would have stayed on the pathway to hell. They would have, they would, their actions would have led to their death. Their actions would have led to them in a Christless grave. Yet God's judgment was their saving grace. Many of these people testified that they would never have bowed down in prayer had God not put them on their knees through trying circumstances. They found a church and a man or a woman of God preaching the message of salvation. Today, they are faithful Christians because the Lord allowed them to experience some measure of judgment. I thought I was going to do what I was going to do. I thought I was going to live how I was going to live. God judged and because he judged and rather let me go on to a Christless grave, I'm faithful because he judged and rather let me go on to hell. I'm, 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 I'm committed to him. I'm serving him. And we're asked the question here, when have you felt like the Lord had when have you felt like the Lord allowed you to experience the difficult so he could reach you? So I get the testimony of, I was staring on and off for 16 years, excuse me, six years, right? Um, Different things like that. I remember there was a season around 14 where like at this point I was on, I, 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 it sounds bad, but the reality of it is, is I was over it. I was over church. I was somewhat over God. Um, they never gotten that bad, right? Exposed to different things, facing different things, home a certain way. None of this, I couldn't see God's hand in any of it. Now I'm sick, going back and forth to the emergency room almost um, every month. Um, missing school at least once every week. My grades are dropping. Fast forward now, like parents living hundreds of miles apart. I went from being an honor roll student to a high school dropout. All these various things are happening. I have nothing to bake on. All my friends in DC, I'm here in Salisbury. Um, education, it, it's of not. Um, gifts and talents, they're whatever. Um, the only thing they're doing is giving me a somewhat healthy outlet, though it wasn't always healthy. I found myself in a place where I literally had Nothing, but I, I talk about I had nothing but God in the camera. Camera started messing up, couldn't even take photos. I had nothing but God. And I was like, all right, then God, if 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 you will restore me, then I'll serve you. If you will restore me, I'll believe you. You'll be real because at this point, it just, I just wasn't too sure. Yet God was faithful enough to restore me. And when it seemed like my life was in shambles when I seen like everything was in disarray, falling out of order. There's been other situations since then, but I can say that 
every time that everything seems out of my control, God is in complete control. Every time that things seem to be in disarray, everything seems to be falling apart, in all actuality, it was falling into place. And that is my testimony I'm making on it. Every time that I didn't know what to do, how to go about it, what to depend on, I had nothing else but God, God showed him so faithful. So that is where I serve him. Even at a young age, that, no, no, because I, I already, the little I tried didn't help. The little I tried didn't work. And you want me to try more just to be born? Into, no, because my God has never failed. My God has always been dependable. My God has always been faithful. That is why you see me testify. That is why you see me live the life that I live. The third part of the lesson, which is more so a conclusion. But it says that God reveals his secrets to the prophets. God revealed the coming judgment to prophets so that they could warn others. The prophets in scripture saw many wondrous things. They not only saw coming judgment, but they also foresaw the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The greatest secret of all time was revealed to Amos' contemporary, the 8th century prophet Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied of a child who would be born to bring salvation. Although God often sends judgment, the Lord will manifest himself in the flesh and become the Prince of Peace. And we see that um, specific prophecy in Isaiah 9 and 6. Just as God revealed his word to these prophets, even so, the Lord desires to give everyone the revelation of the mighty God in Christ Jesus. For without this revelation, salvation in the name of Jesus remains eternity's best kept secret. It says that God speaks through preachers to bring people to repentance. In the days of the Old Testament, God chose to speak through prophets like Amos and Isaiah. Today, he speaks through preachers to draw us to repentance. Just as the Lord sent his word to the prophets in an attempt to change the hearts and minds of the people or of the northern kingdom of Israel in Amos' day, even so he sends his messengers to transform our lives today. Transformation gives, excuse me, transformation begins with repentance. Transformation begins with turning away from what it is we were doing before and turning toward God, turning toward Christ. Transformation begins with putting off of the old man and putting off of the old nature, putting off whatever it is that we want God to transform us out of. Transformation begins with repentance. We must acknowledge our sins and ask the Lord to forgive each one. If we obey the preaching of the word of God, we can escape the judgment coming for us. Some of us have already felt the sting of judgment on our lives. We must recognize the consequences of living outside of the will of the law of the Lord. Sadly, and it says we must heed the preached word of God. Sadly, many do not heed the call. In the end, they face terrible judgment. Such was the case in the northern kingdom of Israel. The people became depraved and therefore had no desire to repent. Amos 7 records how Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, told Amos to leave in order to prevent him from prophesying to the people. The elite northerners found too much comfort in their wealth and in their security to heed the preached word of God. We must heed the word of God and repent. Without repentance, we will find catastrophe for our lives. We will also see destruction rise upon our nation. Those who have received salvation should pray for those in authority and repent for the, sign, the sins of their nation. Lest they see God judge their country just like the Almighty judged the northern kingdom of Israel in the book of Amos. We're asked the final question, how can people avoid getting caught up in possessions and the pursuit of both? My answer would be, as Pastor would say, keep first things first. Keep first things first. Remember that it's God and he alone that is the source of all these things that you falsely put your confidence in. He's the source of your wealth. He's the source of your security. He's the source of your job. He's the source of whatever your et cetera is. And we ought to put all our security and all our trust in him. Trust God above all else. Eternalizing the message very short this week would say to us, sometimes good saints of God can become wary and well-doing. 
Many of the faithful have heard numerous sermons, Bible studies, and testimonies, so much so that they can become immune to the power of good teaching and preaching. Perhaps we are hearing similar messages because the Lord is trying to get our attention. What seems to be overused can actually be a call to repent before life is over. What seems to be running the mill should make us run to the altar. Since we know that God will do nothing unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets, we should stop texting messages during the service and pay more careful attention to the message the Lord is sending us from the greatest text of all time, his word. Again, the lesson is the prophetic voice. We've talked about the prophetic voice, and if you have not caught it, what is the prophetic voice? Who carries the prophetic voice? Your man or your woman of God, your pastor, and those who serve under him carry the prophetic voice. It's not going to be the popular person that has prophet in their title. Prophetess in their title is not going to be, and I'm not saying that it can't be, but it's not going to be the person that you follow on social media because they seem to fluff, they have a fluffy word, they have a good, they have something to make you dance. No, the prophetic voice will always, and it will only be the voice that echoes the word of God. It will always, and it will only be the voice that repeats what it is that God is saying. It won't be contra contradictory to his word. It won't be contradictory to what it is that God is doing. It's not going to be comfortable, but it's going to be true. So again, the lesson on this morning is the prophetic voice. I pray you've received something out of the lesson. I pray that you have been encouraged. I pray that you have been admonished, that you take heed to the warning, that we have to be mindful that we are able to hear the voice of God, especially in these times. We have to be mindful that we are able to take heed and hear the prophetic voice, the voice um, of the servant that God has chosen to bring forth his word, the voice of the servant that God has chosen to warn us and to encourage us and to prophesy to us. I pray that you take, admon take admonishment that you take heed to the admonishment to make sure that you can hear the prophetic voice of God. Again, good morning to you. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And enjoy Sunday morning worship service. God bless.